12 o'clock rock, here we are, Mina, Marco, and me on Monday, our starting show for the week, you know, sort of a, 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 a may I say, a, a dose of energy, that's what we got here on 12 noon every Monday. And Mina is in the post office just listening until she gets out of there, so um, uh, we're going we're gonna to have live with Mina in a minute. And Marco is live now, uh, and he, uh, he's in his office, I believe, in Hilo at ProVision Solar. So welcome to the show, both of you, especially Marco, who can answer me for the moment. One enchanted morning, <laughs> I am with my best friends, I am with my best friends, how much better can it be? Thank Ooh. you, Jay. <laughs> it's a talent that goes beyond anything I've seen before. It must be your life is agreeing with you, Marco. So I saw you well, last week at the Hawaii Power Conference. It was the fifth such one. It was in Waikiki, it was at the Hilton on Kuhio Avenue, and you were there, and gee whiz, it looked like a hundred or more people were there, and they had uh, two or three days of, um, what shall I say, uh, expensive summit conference discussion. Um, and I, I was there because I moderated a panel, I thought I did anyway, on the, on the Monday in the morning, and then you came in and then was off and running. Uh, and I wanted to get a, a, a handle from you on, on how the uh, Hawaii Power Conference, which is produced by UC and a guy named Stephen Curry, who came from the mainland to set it up. Um, so what did you think of that conference, Marco? Well, candidly, I mean, not a whole lot of earth-breaking stuff comes out of these conferences. To me, it's more of an opportunity to, to see friends, meet new people, and to kind of take uh, one's pulse of where the energy uh, uh, dynamic, what the energy dynamic is like uh, at any given moment in time. Uh, and it's also very interesting to hear the variety of perspectives uh, from folks like uh, myself who live in the state and uh, my utility friends who live in the state and others who live in the state versus folks uh, who come from great distances and uh, bring a more kind of macro perspective and I tell you one thing I'm just really struck by Jay is that I mean there's so much uh, hyperventilation uh, regarding the potential for growth of, uh, of photovoltaics uh, uh, on a global basis and also on in the US especially thanks to the the continuation the extension of the uh, federal investment tax credit uh, so you look at all this uh, hyperbole and uh, an enthusiastic talk about uh, dramatic increases the number of gigawatts uh, uh, a gigawatt being by the way uh, a million megawatts uh, and compare that to the real and practical limitations that we here in the state uh, in terms of rooftop solar are facing in a very real and tangible and in our face way so i i wanted to give my perspective as someone in the trenches Number one is someone who's been following the data very closely here over the past years, and, and it, it's, it's quite the contrast between the, the, the hyperbole of uh, solar is poised to do great things across the, the globe, and that's, that's good news. I'm not poo-pooing that at all. But to contrast that to, uh, to what's going on in our very own uh, little state here, and uh, it is, it's, it's quite the contrast. So uh, that's kind of a roundabout, I guess, uh, answer to your question. But, uh, you know, they're, they're worthwhile. I enjoy um, going to those uh, those uh, gatherings uh, on a semi-regular basis. So um, no complaints, and I really appreciate the, the organizers at EUCI. Uh, they were great, and they got some good people there. And, uh, and uh, like uh, Forrest Gump said, that's all I have to say about that. Okay, but it's not all I have to say about that. <clears throat> I, I felt that this was more of an industry conference um, you know, than a government or a sustainability conference. I, I didn't hear much, maybe you heard it after I left, but I didn't hear much about climate change. Uh, I heard about economics. I heard about technology. I heard about, um, you know, making money on the way to 2045. That's what I heard. Uh, was there a discussion of climate change anywhere along the line? Uh, not, not that I heard, no. No, there wasn't a whole lot of discussion about 
climate change. It was more uh, micro uh, micro issues rather than global macro. Yeah, it was technical. It was technical, and it was um, you know new entrepreneurial activities and uh, how we how we going to get it together and solve the problem on a technical basis. I, I didn't you know it's very interesting. I did not hear a lot of complaining about the utility. Um, and as you know, as a test, when I, I I don't know if you noticed this, but when I gave my panel, I said, you know, look, the lights are on. Uh, how about a gentle round of applause for Hawaiian Electric? And you know, the applause came immediately. <clears throat> and I took that as the answer to a kind of test question. I mean, how are people feeling about Hawaiian Electric these days? <clears throat> and I had the sense, Marco, that people are feeling better about Hawaiian Electric these days. There wasn't a lot of talk, um, you know, talk down about it. There wasn't a lot of complaining about it. Uh, there wasn't a lot of in interconnect bashing or anything like that. And for that matter, there wasn't a lot of talk about the next era deal either. Am I right? Or did it, this take place after I left? No, there, there was not a whole lot of talk about the, uh, the merger, which, by the way, the hearings uh, restarted at 9.30 this morning. Uh, last I looked, uh, uh, Jim Magello, who is under Connie Lau there in the HEI hierarchy, uh, Jim Magello is on the witness stand being questioned by uh, uh, Jeff Ono, the consumer advocate. So there was not much discussion. Uh, and, and interestingly, there was zero, from what I could tell, zero representation from next year. The, you know, Hawaiian Electric had a number of folks. Uh, Sharon Suzuki, president of Maui Electric, was over there. But I don't believe next year had anybody there. So I was kind of surprised about that. But in terms of uh, utility, uh, criticisms of the utility, one of my uh, eco friends told me that they had been to the... Um, I don't know if it's the annual, but a regular gathering of the Hawaii Solar Energy Association, HSCA, and uh, the climate at that gathering was uh, anything but uh, utility friendly, which is pretty much what I'd expect from that group uh, in general. But, uh, I mean, just because there wasn't squawking at the utility in this conference doesn't mean that uh, there's uh, not considerable grumbling going on uh, from uh, what I'll call the usual suspects. I got a I got a sense, and I want to bounce it off you that <clears throat> that you know we've moved on we've moved on from the interconnect issue we we we've gotten philosophical about the next era merger um, and we looked at least at this conference about how uh, how we can do it and what's been missing from from the recipe lately and um, especially about smart grids and and you know that STEM company Tad. Um, <clears throat> Tad from the STEM company was there on my right. panel, and and uh, I thought his presentation was very interesting. He's a very good presenter, um, <clears throat> and it was really all about trying to use batteries on the client side and trying to um, anticipate demand using some very sophisticated algorithms that were written in Silicon Valley. P.S. I don't know why those algorithms can't be written here. Um, and I, you know, frankly think that uh, we, we could, should do better in terms of uh, writing software for energy right here. Anyway, his, um, his idea, his initiative, his product, if you will, uh, which he's deploying in various businesses, I guess on a, mm, a startup pilot, pilot ba basis, he's associated with the uh, Energy Accelerator, you know, and various other supporters. Um, but, but it sounded pretty good to me, and it also sounded like there were others that were getting in on that. And before you know it, we would have some very sophisticated gear here, running sophisticated new batteries, new t you know, style of batteries. Um, I think his batteries were Toshiba. I'm not sure of that. Um, and he was, um, you know, uh, anticipating demand. Predictive analytics, it was, to anticipate demand so that they could use the battery in the most efficient way possible. Um, and he wasn't necessarily serving homeowners, by the way. He was serving uh, office building and industry, uh, which I thought was um, you know, kind of refreshing because that we can use it there. I don't know if you heard his presentation, but it seemed to me that that was a real positive addition to you know, the technology we've been waiting for. And, um, and others should be doing the same thing. Maybe they are. Uh, and the utility should be learning from that and maybe doing, you know, similar kinds of demand analysis analytics on the, uh, you know, utility side of the, of the aisle. Uh, do you have any thoughts about that? Did you hear him? 
No, I did not. I did not. I mean, uh, my uh, overall hit on uh, battery storage is that uh, right now there is uh, a lot more uh, smoke than there is fire, that there's a lot more hype and spin and, and fantasy than there is reality on the ground. And, I mean, I, I hope battery storage will will be bigger and bolder sooner than we uh, we all think. But the, the reality for our state is that... Uh, it's going to take, uh, I think, a considerable amount of time to integrate battery storage on both the uh, utility side of the of the meter, uh, the utility side of the equation, and also on the customer side of the meter. And as I think uh, I, I may have noted uh, when we spoke last, uh, Jay, but if I did not, I will tell you that I, I have access to the uh, almost in real time data from the utility companies here uh, regarding what kind of uh, volume of interconnect agreements they're getting in the post-NEM world, post-NEM as of you know, October 12th of last year, we're in the brave new world of uh, post-net uh, energy metering, and their so-called uh, customer self-supply, or CSS, uh, that is for non-export, non-export the grid-type PV systems up to 100 kilowatts, the three companies, Helco, Eco, and Mito, have received a, uh, a grand total of one application as of uh, a couple weeks ago. So whoever's talking about batteries, uh, uh, they're doing interesting things. And my friend Chris DeBone at Hawaii Energy Connection and his new company eGear doing uh, interesting thing with batteries. But in terms of making a near-term, let alone immediate impact, uh, that's not happening. And as uh, one of the points I made in my presentation uh, last uh, Friday. What panel you, were you on? What was the name of the panel? Uh, officially, we were looking at the financial aspect of uh, of renewable energy. Where is the money coming? Going to come from? Where does it need to come from to to go where we all want to uh, to go? Uh, but I I made the point that uh, as a small to midland contractor, which uh, my company is, that uh, I have to necessarily be fo just as focused, if not more so, on. Uh, what can continue to bring in revenue to keep my company going and to pay my bills and pay my employees and stay viable. And I don't have the, the luxury of spending too much of my time and resources personally or my company's resources as far as what's going to bring revenue in 12 months, 24 months, 36 months. I, I can't afford to do that. So that was one of, one of the things I wanted to note to this group of folks who, you know, there, there weren't that many contractors like me in that room. So that's, uh, you know, it's just a, uh, it's such a contrast from what's being spoken about uh, so much in the popular press and even amongst uh, people in the energy industry, kind of on the, the more macro level and what those of us in the trenches are having to live and breathe and deal with uh, day to day to day. Well, maybe, but maybe it's going to be a division of labor going down the road. Uh, maybe it's going to be some fellow comes to you um, and says, look, uh, I'll, I'll sell you some really good batteries. Um, and I'll sell you, um, you know, devices on the, on the client side uh, that will um, make it most efficient using sophisticated algorithms and checking in all these, you know, big data sources by the Internet. You know, for example, weather, you can get that by the Internet. Um, I don't know what else. You can get all kinds of information using big data. Then you can make some predictive analysis, which is what Tad was talking about. Um, but if, if, I, if he, he came to you or I came to you and said, Marco, you know, why don't, why don't you buy and incorporate my product in your installation of your solar system, would that interest you? Do you think it should interest you? Do you think it will interest you later? Uh, interest me later, perhaps. Interest me now, no. I mean, it, it's kind of as a sidebar note, because I think it's worth noting, is uh, the last session they had there on Friday, Jay, was uh, a group of... Uh, of executives. Uh, there was Jay Ignacio, president of Helco, Sharon Suzuki, president of Maui Electric. Uh, David Bissell from KIUC wasn't able to make it, but uh, Jim Kelly, who's one of his right-hand persons, uh, Jim Kelly was there, and then Alicia Moy, who is the CEO of Hawaii Gas. So these are the four on the concluding panel. And Jim Kelly made the observation that compared to just a few years ago, their systems operators have to be much more on top of things in terms of trying to balance these variable power sources, which they now have two, count them, two utility-scale PV systems, largest in the state, by the way, <coughs> 
two utility scale PV systems on their, in their relatively small grid. They have other independent power producers, and they're planning to have a third utility scale PV system with the dispatchable battery power, which would be the first in the country. Dispatchable meaning that it stores the energy during sunlight and hours and can pr provide power to uh, folks when they get home from work uh, during the peak hours, peak, peak demand hours. So Jim was making the point that things are, uh, you know, radically different or dramatically different now just compared to a few years ago in terms of the challenges and complexity of a, of a grid operator, whether it's Hiko, Helco, Miko, or KIUC, trying to integrate the, all these multiple power sources, uh, generation sources, that are some of them being intermittent. I mean, it's great that Ted's doing what he's doing uh, and the energy accelerator folks are doing what they're doing. But that does not translate overnight, let alone over the week or over the month, to what the utility operators have to deal with in a real-time basis that's in their face on these multiple screens. They're having to live and breathe and monitor every single day. So it's just it, it's an enormous challenge that I think a lot of people who are talking kind of from their cloud perspective, they really don't get how much of a challenge it is. Okay, but you know what, you, what strikes oh, me? Jay, can you hear me oh, now? Hi, Mina. Oh, glad you could join us. How is the United States Postal Service? <laughs> it was it was a little slow. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, what's new about that, eh? <laughs> hey, I, I just wanted to comment uh, on uh, the, the STEM demand response um, um, pilot program. You know, you have to make a, a distinction between um, residential and commercial. Yes. And I think the product that that um, STEM, the product and service that STEM is providing, is geared more for the um, commercial account, and a lot of it makes it viable because they're trying to avoid demand charges. Right. Um, it, and, it's and, demand and, response. And, and, I mean, and, yeah, it's efficiency, right? It's efficiency. Well, I, it, it's kind of, you know, making sure that there's no big spikes in, in the user's um, usage. Right. Which would, tr which would, tr would trigger, um, you know, additional charges and stuff. Right. So, you know, we've we got to make that distinction that there might be economic benefits for these commercial users um, um, to avoid charges that are not assessed the, the residential users. So we just have to be kind of cognizant of that in this conversation. Yeah, well, he, he made a comment that uh, this system that he was selling, you know, could save the um, uh, industrial office building uh, user as, uh, up to 20% on his electric bill just by virtue of that mm -hmm. system. And the system is not expensive. I mean, what do you say? A hundred or two hundred dollars a month um, to have this black mm -hmm. box installed. Not too bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, but I, you know, I was, uh, you know, uh, I was going to say that what 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 stokes me about this is that we we do have algorithms in place where we can use big data, you know, and integrate a lot of different um, information. Uh, disparate information from multiple sources and come up with this, um, you know, predictable analytics. And it strikes me, and I don't know if this is happening now, but it strikes me that we want that on both sides of the aisle. Because as you say, Marco, it's very complex now, much more complex than it was a few years ago. Although, frankly, I think we could have anticipated that it would become complex with the complexity of sources. But, but if we had the same kind of you know, ambitious analytics on the utility side, we could do a better job, it could do a better job at anticipating what it would be getting, uh, you know, from all these sources. And that includes access to the very information that TAD is collecting and the predictions that TAD is making. Because if the utility can have that, and I think they can and should, uh, then the utility can do a great job at predicting what it's going to get and what it has to do to keep everything level. Don't you think that's the future? Well, it's, it's the future of big data. Yeah. And and I mean, it's something that I've written about a lot. It, 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 it in every single sector, you know, whether it's banking, insurance, or 
for everything, the electric utility, it's the age of big data and how quickly we, we can um, are the analytics to make use of that data. Absolutely. Marco, do you have any comment on that? Oh, I'm going to leave it up to the people with bigger heads and brighter than I am, Jay, to, to make sense of the big data stuff. So I <laughs> sincerely take my hats off to Mina and, and others who have more, uh, more, uh, are more Akamai when it comes to stuff like that than I am. Okay, well, on that note, we're going to take a break. <laughs> this is Mina Marina, who joins us from Kauai by Skype Audio. Marco Mangelsdorf, who joins us from the Big Island by Skype Audio. Here on Mina, Marco, and me, which we love to do every noon on Monday. Talking about the Hawaii Power Conference and other things right after this break. Aloha, namaskar, and hello. My name is Anu Hittel, and I host the show called Climate Change Beyond Outrage. We go beyond outrage to find solutions to climate problems facing people, nations, and the world. I hope you will join me here every Tuesday at 1 o'clock. We broadcast live from thinktechhawaii.com. Aloha and bye-bye. Aloha. My name is Reg Baker, and I'm the host of Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. Business in Hawaii is a program that is positive stories about business in Hawaii. Uh, we're tired of hearing the negativity and why it's the wrong place to have a business. We talk about the positive reasons for having a business in Hawaii and, and how to be successful. We broadcast live every Thursday at 2 o'clock. We look forward to seeing you. Aloha. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. Come join us every Friday at 2 p.m. when I interview interesting scientists about what they do, why they do it, and why we should all care about it. It's a lot of fun to see. We hear, and you can learn interesting stuff. You'll hear all kinds of fascinating science, and we know you'll have a great time. Hope to see you then. Bye-bye. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here. Mina Morita, and Marco Mangelsdorf, and me here on Mina, Marco, and me on Mondays. That's four M's, isn't it? Uh, the Hawaii Power Conference and much more. So let's go to the PUC, which, uh, gee whiz, it starts uh, after its recess. It starts its hearings at Blaisdell again today. There was some discussion about uh, how the chair was going to allow it to be videotaped now. What do you think? Well, in fact, uh, I'm watching it on my screen right now. There's actually a recess. Uh, last I saw uh, Jim Magello, who is uh, right under Connie Lau in, uh, in the HEI uh, Hawaiian Electric Industries hierarchy, was on the stand being questioned by uh, Jeff Ono of, uh, of the Consumer Advocate. So, uh, and, yeah, things restarted again at 9.30, and... Uh, supposed to go for um, this week, uh, Monday through Friday, and then next week, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And uh, mm -hmm. I think it's an open question as to whether they're going to get through all the uh, all the witnesses, including uh, the interveners, the uh, Hawaii Island Energy Co-op, uh, which I represent, and, and, and the other 22, 23 some odd interveners. So it's uh, been this kind of strange intermission of six, seven weeks since uh, the last, uh, to the end of, uh, of round one. And uh, it's going to be interesting to see kind of what the flavor is now that we're resuming uh, six, seven weeks later. Well, what's the flavor so far today? Uh, I've only caught snippets uh, between uh, Mr. Ono and Mr. Ajello, so I, I, I don't have enough uh, uh, small, let alone big data, to be able to, uh, to give you a, a characterization. I, I will note that I think it's pretty clear that uh, NextEra has ramped up their, uh, their PR efforts over the past uh, days and that they've been able to uh, uh, bring on board more community and business leaders. Uh, they had a press release that they announced. Uh, all the folks who've uh, joined on to the bandwagon got a ticket for the NextEra train uh, recently. So clearly, they, in my estimation, they're, uh, they're, they're ramping up their uh, their efforts uh, to coincide with uh, with the beginnings of, uh, of round two. So they give every indication that they're still firmly in the game. Uh, Jim Robo, CEO of NextEra, had an earnings call, I believe it was last week, and by all accounts, uh, NextEra is doing very, very well in terms of their overall revenue and profitability. It was like so, $22 uh, billion, dollars, wasn't it? That was a very substantial yeah. profit. Yeah. That's a big profit, gee whiz. And if I'm not mistaken, I don't think he was asked any questions regarding uh, so well, how are things going in Hawaii. So if that, in fact, is true, that's uh, kind of telling by its uh, absence. 
Yeah. And uh, what, the uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, got behind this deal? And um, uh, there were others, do you recall? Uh, uh, possibly the Business Roundtable? Business Roundtable, yeah. Yeah. And uh, that, that was, and, uh, yeah, so, I mean, uh, you know, phase one, we saw uh, various deals made, settlements, if you will, made with the interveners, including the Department of Defense, right? Uh, but now we're into phase two, where we're getting endorsements from around the community. So good for them that they're, you know, they're, they're doing their, they're doing their uh, public relations and uh, getting, getting people to support them. Good for them. Uh, on the other hand, um, you know, I'm not sure that that is going to uh, affect what, what has been a pretty sour proceeding so far. Do you think that's going to change the tide here? Well, I think... I don't... I, I, Jay, I, I disagree with the characterization, characterization that it's soured proceedings. I mean, I think, you know, the questions that need to be asked have been asked, and uh, questions that need to clarify and uh, fill out the record are being asked. But I... You know, there might have been moments, but I wouldn't characterize it. Okay, fair enough. Well, th but do you think do you think that these endorsements uh, are going to have a material effect on the outcome? Well, I just hope that this is a regulatory decision and not a political decision. You know, and 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 again, you know, you have to look at you know what's what's the standard, the criteria to be met for a regulatory decision and if that's being met. And I think, I, I believe that's what's happening right now. What's your, uh, what's your view? Can you express a view on this from what you know so far? Well, I think, you know, the main thing is, is Nexera fit, willing, and able? And I think, you know, it's, it's pretty clear that they have the uh, financial, technical, capability of running a utility. But what are the what are the negatives that run against them? What are the negatives? I, I, I think it's more perception, you know, and how how the deal is characterized. You know, a big mainland company coming in, not a local company. Well, neither is HEI a local company. <laughs> and <laughs> You know, where the majority, the majority of the stockholders are probably institutional investors from out of state. Sure, as they would be in the case of any utility. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and so, so, again, it's um, people's perception. Well, what about the, the, what about the, the issue of, um, you know, whether they are or are willing to do the kinds of things that, you know, that, 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 that the energy community wants to do here, namely a lot of photovoltaic and not so much LNG. Um, are they going to be, I mean, to your view anyway, are they going to be flexible about that or are they going to come in with an agenda that isn't consistent uh, with the agenda we have developed here so far? Well, the law is the law. You know, we have 100 percent RPS um, and, you know, unless they go in and actively lobby to amend the law, the law is the law. Absolutely. You know, and, and I, I, again, I've written about this in my blog. You know, we only um, cede power to them if we give them that power. You know, the, uh, how they behave politically is up to us, we set the standards. You know, we fund the regulator. Yeah. So, um, so uh, uh, are, are you, <clears throat> uh, I, you know, there's been some noise about how large utility companies can have huge influence on the government. Are you concerned about that at all? Well, I, again, they only have power if we cede power to them. You know, if you have a weak regulator, yes, they can control the regulator. If you, um, if politicians accept money, uh, political contributions, and and react to their lobbying, 
then that's our fault. You know, so so again, this is we 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 cede our authority and our power only if we give it to them. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, it's it's all a matter of dealing with foreign investment, and we have to manage foreign investment. We can't uh, either worship them or uh, go paranoid on them. We have to manage them as a business matter and as a, as right. a matter and of law. And, and manage them, uh -huh. that means that the regulators have to stand fast on what they believe is the best course. Right. And this will be and, a great test for Hawaii. You know, and, you know, just like Marco, I haven't been able to really watch the, the proceedings this morning, um, the hearing this morning, but the snippets that I did catch was really interesting because, you know, again, you have, um, you have ATI, which was, which had no vision moving forward. I mean, that's basically what I got, you know, and, and they're basically saying that the PUC never allowed them to develop their vision moving forward. Well, you know, being part of the PUC, we stepped in because, because, the company lacked vision, you know, and we stepped in because they weren't making the operational changes that was necessary to run an efficient company. And, and so, uh, I, again, the, um, you know, there was some really interesting questioning going on um, between Jeff Ono and Jim Agello, the CFO of... Um, ATI. Is this, now, this and is available on um, Olelo, is it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Channel yeah. 54, I expect. And, and then, so, so you know, my, my basic thought is, boy, do you really want a company, a parent company, that has no vision for the future, that's struggling for it, to remain the owner of the, your, your major utility? What about um, what about your blog? What is your your blog? What's the name so I can go there and look? Energy Dynamics was it? Um, it's Nina Morita Energy Dynamics dot com. Okay, and so you, www Nina Morita Energy Dynamics dot com in all one word. You you've been you've been very prolific on that. You've been writing a lot. Good for you. Um, I think it's so, great. Oh, you know, there's so much at stake here. And, and again, you want a utility that is um, uh, forward-thinking, that that can handle this major transformation that's going forward, and uh, that has the culture embedded within its organization to do that. And, uh, you know, I think we can all see equal kind of Foundering in in this transformational process, mm. um, I, I, I think it's only been in the last year that they have a firmer grasp. But you know, you're you're talking about huge cultural changes within the organization, just to be able to weather um, the disruptions that are going on right now. So, Marco, how, how does this integrate? Um, with Hawaii Island uh, Energy Co-op, or you know the the Maui uh, uh, the Maui uh, initiative, which is uh, which the mayor is investigating now of having a uh, county-owned utility. How does all this, wh you know, where does that fit in in the landscape that uh, Mina has just uh, described? No, that's a great question, Jay. And uh, I mean. Looking at Maui first, I mean, we have the backdrop of uh, the so-called Guernsey report, which was uh, prepared by a company called Guernsey on the mainland uh, about a month or so ago that uh, the county of Maui uh, contracted, I believe, was $70,000 for them to come up with a study looking at what options uh, the county of Maui should consider regarding alternate ownership of uh, Maui Electric. And they looked at the co-op model. They looked at the municipal utility or muni model and also the uh, uh, so-called ISO RTO, ISO being independent system operator and RTO regional transmission 
is it operator, I think, as well, organization. And to what extent uh, any of those options are going to be pursued by Mayor Alan Arakawa, I think, uh, remains uh, a huge question mark. Uh, it's my understanding, kind of on an anecdotal fashion, that uh, there is a lack of consensus within the County of Maui administration to begin with as to uh, what they should do, if anything. Plus, they've got the challenge of not just uh, Maui proper, but also uh, Maui Electric is uh, on uh, Molokai and Lanai. And there's there's no uh, cable uh, for the foreseeable future that's going interconnect to interconnect the three islands. So uh, I, I don't know what kind of traction, really, uh, that the report is going to lead to, if any, uh, within the County of Maui administration as far as pursuing this. Uh, as far as the co-op, option goes for the big island. I just happened to uh, see that a bill has been introduced on the House side by uh, Nicole Lowen, who's a Kono rep uh, on the House side, uh, that would be uh, looking into the possibility of, uh, of uh, bonds uh, bonds being issued for the, the development of energy cooperatives. I just got this uh, an hour or two ago, and I haven't really dissected it in great detail. But, uh, I mean, in terms of the co-op uh, here, uh, you know, our position hasn't changed in the past year since we came into being, so to speak, which is that the possible uh, change of control of uh, one of the most important, uh, venerable, oldest companies in the state that uh, is, owns and operates three of uh, the most important public infrastructures in the state, uh, Helco, Hico, and Miko, that this uh, is an opportunity that comes around once in several lifetimes and that we came into being essentially with the express in, intent and purpose of putting out there uh, to be part of the public discussion, put out there uh, the benefits as we see them and the advantages of the cooperative model for this island. And uh, we continue to be n uh, neither for nor against the merger per se, but uh, have advocated uh, very steadily uh, that uh, it, this deserves to be part of the discussion. So uh, again, we're, we're, you know, uh, in terms of the football analogy are we in the third quarter or in the fourth quarter i don't know it's <laughs> difficult to say but i can i can tell you this i think the likelihood of a regulatory decision by june 3rd and june 3rd is the uh, the last day of the six month extension of the agreement it was one for one year from december 3rd 2014 to december 3rd 2015 and then they extended it for six months to june 3rd 2016 uh what comes after june 3rd if there's no regulatory decision i've spoken to a number of people who are kind of in the game and and it's kind of shrugging his shoulders and looking skyward and saying we're not sure we don't know so i always I enjoy when when they talk about the date by which the puc will rule they say by june tw june 3rd or later so right. that doesn't tell you a whole lot i mean it's it's saying well it could be before june 3rd and by june 3rd um, but it also could be after june 3rd so i'm not sure what june 3rd means and <laughs> in, in all of that <laughs> Which way, really? Anyway, uh, so now, now uh, you're a member of the, uh, you know, the solar industry, Marco, and my 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 understanding is the solar industry opposes the merger. At the same time, the solar industry is is all hoo hoo at, at Hawaiian Electric. So what what do you gather is the position of the solar industry on going forward? Well. I think I'd first note that the um, solar industry, in quotation marks here, is uh, not all that different from trying to, uh, to use an overused metaphor, trying to herd cats. <laughs> <laughs> that there's no shortage of different views in the solar industry here. And I, I have observed and opined in the past that it's interesting that some of these individuals and some of these groups who have been uh, Hawaiian Electric's most vehement critics uh, have, um, in light of the possibility of Hawaiian Electric Industries being purchased or acquired, whatever verb you want to use, by uh, Next Year Energy out of Juneau Beach, Florida, that they are um, um, shocked, shocked and, and horrified to some extent about the possibility of the utility companies that they have vilified for so many years uh, could uh, be taken over by some other unknown or less known great bigger utility far, far away. So, um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's an authority problem, you know. Whoever is an authority, they're unhappy with. 
So, uh, Mina, you know, we're, we're running out of time, but I wanted to ask you this. I mean, how do you feel about, uh, you know, the Maui possibility, uh, county, county operated, county owned uh, solar, or rather, um, you know, energy company? And um, how do you feel about HIEC? How do you feel about third party uh, new organizations being formed and sort of getting in on where HECO was before? I mean, could that happen? Would that happen? And how would it happen? And should it happen? Any thoughts? Well, first of all, you know, how a utility operates um, isn't much different. You know, um, the, the ownership model of how a utility operates doesn't really differ. And, I mean, case in point, you look at um, KIUC, you know, while everybody grumbles about utility-scale projects within the HECO territories, you know, that's what KIUC is developing because that's what they found is lower cost and most beneficial for all of their customers. So, you know, you're not going to find very much operational differences um, uh, between ownership models. And again, you know, the, the key question is, how is the leadership going to handle major um, transformation and disruption within the sector um, during this period? Do they have the right leadership? Do they have the right organizational co culture? And, you know, that, that, again, would be similar across all ownership models. The, the other thing is it's not easy to, to change owners. Um, in, in the case of a municipal, you have to go through a condemnation proceeding, likely go through a condemnation proceeding. That's going to, as the Guernsey report points out, that's going to take um, some law changes moving forward, um, plus the condemnation process. And with the co-op model, you know, you have to work with a willing seller. And right now, we, you know, there's no indication that um, they would like to sell to a cooperative. Yeah, let's, let's, assume, let's assume that neither Hawaiian Electric nor Nextera would be a willing seller. But can't the PUC step in and make them more willing? Can't the PUC step in and make this happen if it wants? No, not really, because that's not the role of the PUC. You know, the role of the PUC is to ensure that there's um, an entity that is fit, willing, and able. And, you know, with, without the, an entity before them, how can they make that evaluation? Got it. So, and Marco, then, how then, about uh, you? you uh, we're out of time, so I want to give Marco just a few seconds to respond mm -hmm. if he wants to uh, Mina's thoughts. Marco, why don't you respond and close? Sure. I agree with Mina 100% that fit willing, and able, fit, willing, and able are the required bars. That said, I believe that it has become very, very clear in the course of these proceedings so far that this deal is not going to be approved or disapproved based on those criteria. I believe that the parties have made clear kind of across the board that uh, that's the minimum bar that they have to clear in order to get approval. But I think there is a lot more. My perception is that there's a lot more involved, other important factors beyond the minimum of fit, willing, and able. I really have no doubt that whatever wishes we may have, that it be a strictly a regulatory decision based on what's, ri what's written in black and white that these three commissioners are going to be taking into account things beyond the minimum criteria. Marco, we'll have to leave it there. Yeah. We're out of time. Uh, our next show is coming on board. But uh, let's plan to, to regroup here two weeks from today and continue the discussion, especially, especially with regard to anything that happens. Uh, I'm sure something will happen in the PUC hearings at Blaisdell that will happen in the interim. Thank you so much, Mina Morita. Thanks for coming around. Okay. And Marco, thank you for being available for these discussions. We enjoy them so much. They are so helpful. Here on Mina, Marco, and me, uh, so much to discuss. Thank you. Thank you both. Aloha. Okay, thank you. Thanks, thank you. Marco. Thank you. Okay, bye. -bye. bye, -bye.